Welcome everybody to our weekly podcast show. Thank you so much for giving me your time and your earbuds. And this time round, I will actually share this episode um, on YouTube where people can actually see this icon that I have been idolizing for a long time. <laughs> and, and Will is actually my very first guest inside the Unstoppable Eventrepreneur podcast. I am <laughs> super picky about who I want to be on our podcast, but this guy here has done so much for me, even just by listening to his podcast during COVID, that I was like, oh my God, I need to do what he's doing. And he's my, he's my inspiration. So I promised myself not to be stargaze and, and, and talk nonstop. I am going to, I'm going to let Will introduce himself and tell us a little bit about who he is, his background, uh, his business. And today's topic is for him to share with us what did he do with his business for him to be able to retire so young? Listen, this dude is only 21 years old. <laughs> You know, but I'm, okay, listen, he's young. I, I wish I was one. I'm actually 33 <laughs> now, but still. 33 years old. <laughs> Can you believe him? He's semi-retired doing what he loves. And and I, you know, I talk so much in, in, in my podcast and inside our mentorship program, inside, you know, inside our Facebook group, my Instagram about all about business. You know, and people make it sound so hard that business is so hard to do. And I'm not going to deny the fact that it is hard, but you can do it smart and make it less harder. And when I when I talked to Will um, recently and he told me about his semi-retires, I, I said, you, you, you what? <laughs> I was like, you must come to my podcast. I was just talking about numbers in, in my last few episodes, understanding your numbers so you know what you're working towards and, and when you can actually retire from your business if you so if you want to do so so today i'm going to let him give you the behind the scene of how he built his business so he can retire at the age that he, where he is right now 33 and then um he has also built a very special community that you know like what we call the event planners like underground so i want him to talk a little bit about that as well so again i'm not going to get any more i'm going to let our, our guest talk and then we are Get ready your pen, your paper, and pay attention. This is gold, okay? All right, Will, take it away. <laughs> Thanks, May. Uh, yeah, I guess so. I'll start with an introduction for anybody who hasn't heard about me. Um, my name is Will Curran. Um, so I'm part like techie nerd, part business nerd, part marketing nerd, part event nerd, basically. So, you know, I've just, uh, I've kind of taken all those things and combined them into what I do. Um, and yeah, I've been in the industry for my gosh, how many years I started endless 16 years ago now at this point, 17, it was a long time ago. Yeah. 17, almost 17 years ago now, actually. Yeah. And basically started off in high school, actually DJing and grew the company to now the point where I got into the day to day. Everything's well documented. I got great leaders in place and everything's kind of just running itself, which is pretty awesome. And um, yeah, I mean, the big thing for me is I've always been kind of obsessed with like, yeah, how do you market things? How do you create amazing experiences? I've also been very tech oriented. So I like nerd out on a lot of technology. So I'm, that's where a lot of automations come from. And then ultimately too, like I'm just a big business nerd too. I love reading business books and understanding business and how to do business better. Um, and luckily, I think I'm at that point in my career where like I've read so much and learned so much. I've actually gotten to implement it all over these years. And that's probably been one of the best parts. Um, and yeah, now Endless has grown to being, um, you know, one of the top event agencies in the entire world. Um, we're one of the most recognized brands for sure because of a lot of our online content, our podcasts, and having awesome listeners like May out there. And uh, the, the other piece of it too is the, the community, which we'll talk about, which is kind of like my new project, which is um, essentially just a place that I've kind of wanted to gather all the smartest people in the events industry into one single spot where people can ask questions, share resources, share templates of you know their, their blueprints, ask business questions, anything like that. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit later, but 
that's pretty much it. And yeah, like uh, the great part about this is uh, uh, in December, I actually um, hired my my COO basically um, to take over running the company. And he's been doing a phenomenal job and um, just been really, really happy again to, to work with him and, um, you know, having him run the company. And it's just, yeah, we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about how we d- we pulled it all off over these massive 16 years. But I'd say a lot of the effort over the last, you know, three to four years is really where uh, we've kind of come from to, to get to where I am at this point. Fantastic, because that's where I will be asking about hiring, training, firing, trust. Oh my gosh! The whole nine years. For okay. sure. So when you when you so you started the business when you were young, I would yeah, say, very young, right? seventeen, young, yeah, yeah. seventeen years old. So when you started your business, right? Did you ever think that you will retire the business, or you'll be like, "This is my baby. I am going <laughs> to. I'm going to work until I die." <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I think like even until I got started getting involved with like entrepreneurs organization accelerator, I remember like that's the one I really started meeting other entrepreneurs who were all, you know, really working towards the same kind of level of goals that I was looking at. And I remember that like someone was talking about like, oh yeah, are you looking to retire? And people, it was funny how many business owners think of their business as what their retirement's going to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and honestly, like I was like 20 years old when I heard that for the first time. Um, so I, I had no con- concept of retirement, just wanting to stop or anything like that. So I think like younger Will would have said, hey, my business was going to be my retirement. And honestly, I think up until maybe about three years ago or so, I really thought to myself, the business was very much designed around my lifestyle and what how I wanted to to run and live. Like I wanted to travel a lot. I loved being on site at events. I was really good at it. I basically optimized everything for my happiness. And one interesting thing I think is that, you know, I didn't think to myself like I wanted to, to retire. I thought to myself, well, I'll just do this until I get bored of it, basically go forever. Um, but I think as I started to grow the business and I think as I started hitting this pinnacle point and I think COVID helped, uh, or not helped, but, uh, made kind of opened my eyes to this in a lot of ways was my desire to be like, Hey, I think it's time to cre- create space for something new. And I also will give a shout out to a couple of my employees, a couple of my like key leadership people, um, who really like pushed me to say like, what do you really want to do? And I remember initially pushing back, uh, at the idea of hiring someone else to replace me as CEO, Um, of the company. So basically I haven't sold the company or anything like that, but the goal was basically like, Hey, take me out of the day to day, but then still be able to keep the same level of income that I was, I was doing before I ended up, uh, when I was actually doing the event work. But what's interesting is like a lot of my employees pushed me and said like, Hey, like, why don't you do the things that like focus on content generation and, you know, get out of the day to day and hire a CEO. And initially I was very, very defensive about it. Um, and rightfully so it's your baby. So you initially are like, why, why I can do this. I think also too, I, I had this sense that I felt like I was losing trust within that team. So I'd like, oh, Hey, maybe they're starting to see something I don't, and I need to pre-prove myself that I'm capable of doing this, you know? Um, but really after, like, I think I had some really deep reflections, um, and took a lot of time to like, think about it. I started realizing like, maybe this was time for me to start finding what was going to be new. And I think when I started working on the community side by side, while also running the company, I started like realizing like, maybe there are these other passion projects and things like that, that bring fulfillment outside of the company that I've been working on for so long. Um, so, so yeah, the, the, the short answer is, um, I never thought I would retire, um, but you know, it, it was a process that kind of took a lot of self-reflection over the time. When I think a lot of times when we think about retiring, we feel because we come from, we came from corporate America, right? Mm-hmm. Like for you, you started your business when you're 17 years old. Did you go like all in or were you working, were you working for somebody and then started all your in. business? Side hustle? I didn't okay. even know what a job, real job was like. <laughs> I've only had one okay. real job. I worked at like a golf course, washing golf carts. Like after like, I think I uh, was, well, seven, like a couple months after I had started the company as an official company, but I didn't do that out of needing the money. It was more so my friend was like, Hey, I have this job. I get paid $15 an hour to wash golf carts. This was, I was like $15 an hour to wash golf carts. I'm in, you know? And like, you know, I just did as like an after school kind of job thing but eventually I got too busy I had to quit it <laughs> well, there's a good problem so yes. I think for corporate America has created this pers- this this idea that when you retire is when you don't do anything that's called work mm-hmm. right you don't do anything that's called work that means you no longer have to wake up at a certain time go to work knock off at a certain time you know, and, and produce results. 
So retirement means that, oh, you can do whatever you want, whenever you want, wherever you want. So <laughs> for, for, for people in corporate America and then moving into entrepreneurship, I think they still have that tie to that image that, that okay, so that is retirement. And that's why there's a mm -hmm. hesitation when they started their business, especially yes. after the business take off, they feel that they're so vested in terms of financial and also the um, and energy that there's a reluctance. There's a reluctance to give up the reins to yeah. people to run the business because they are afraid that they can never truly retire if they were to hand it over to someone because they can't trust that person or the team to continue yeah. to build the stability and for them to enjoy retirement. Do you totally. agree? Yeah, totally. Uh, one of my like mentors once said like retirement means like to be put out to pasture. It's like you retire like a, an old farm animal and you do nothing. And like for me, a retirement, like I've also, now that I've had a chance to experience what this like early retirement kind of looks like, it, it, what you find is that you don't actually end up stopping working you actually want to work more because now you have all these ideas and passions and things like that and you know everything like that but like you know ultimately for me like I, what i want to create is this is a sense of entrepreneurship is that like that your business doesn't like own you that you own it and that it generates income for you to do what you want to do and the 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 trust thing that you talked about is like i'm sure we'll talk, dive deep in this is like it's huge because yeah you initially just think to yourself no one can run my business as well as i am and you're kind of afraid because it's just like again like it's a baby and i i've not i'm not a parent or anything like that so i don't know like if that truly is a great correlation but you definitely have to see it that your business, really the whole goal of you being an entrepreneur should be for you to to get out of it, right? And to get allowed to run itself without you. Um, otherwise, if you're just inside of it and you have to report, you have to be there every day from nine to five and it prevents you from doing other things that you want to do. I mean, that's a job, not really entrepreneurship in my opinion. There's so many golden nuggets dropped in the last three minutes. <laughs> I hope you guys are taking notes. First, Will said that, you wanted to build the business in a, from a place of happiness, right? What makes me happy? You want yes. to be able to do something that makes you happy. And then he said something that you, you know, the business doesn't own you. You own it and it produces the income for you to do whatever you want to do. Everybody, please write down this tagline and paste it everywhere that you see visible, okay? Every single day on your phone, on your computer, on the door every day you walk in and out you see it i think because we we are so involved in the business that we forgot why we're in the business and then the excuse that we gave to ourselves is but i love it so much i don't mind working all these hours on it right i love it so much and i don't mind working all these hours on it and then you're afraid to take a vacation you're afraid Definitely. to step away from the business. So why did you have a business in the first place, right? You say you want all this freedom, correct? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, oh it's it, it. Well, it's interesting too because like in a lot of ways too, I think sometimes when you're within the business and this is what my learning was through this whole entire process was that, you know, sometimes you get once you're in the business, you think to yourself, I don't want anything else other than this. This is perfect. This is like the best life. But in reality for me, like, I gained so much clarity upon having the freedom to kind of explore and work on new things that now it's made me more passionate about ideas. Like, so for example, like I, I got really lucky that this kind of all happened right around the AI revolution that's been going on. Mm -hmm. So, and I've been like, obviously I'm very fascinated with technology. Well, before, if there was like a new technology revolution or a new tool or something like that, I would probably try to figure out a way to utilize it in the business. Mm -hmm. And what that happened is I think a lot of times I pushed that innovation onto my employees, which they didn't necessarily like. It was kind of overwhelming for them. So what happened is then I didn't really get a chance to fully explore that that technology because it was always within the constraints of how does it work within my existing business. But in reality, like what ended up happening is because I was out of the day to day, I went deep into the AI stuff and I started thinking about how maybe I could build new ideas and new products from it. And that's something that 
I honestly mentally was blocked from doing, I think before that point, like I used to always say to myself, Oh, I'll probably do endless forever because I really don't know what else I would do. I don't I haven't gotten another great idea of what, something. I never thought of like a global event management company that was different than everybody else. And, but when you start to get that freedom in your mind, even if you are partially still active within the company, that freedom of your brain space is just uncomprehensibly valuable. And it's this thing that you had before you started your current company, which might be trapping you in a lot of ways. I couldn't agree more. Someone inside my community shared with me that how, how, do, you, how do you manage a good balance when the company is growing so fast and you, you feel like you're always behind, you're trying to catch up, you're trying to do many things at one time. And I said, make a list of the things in your business from client fulfillment to day-to-day -day operations. What are your energy leaks? Okay. What's leaking your energy? Because if you are doing things that, that you are not fully present, but you just got to do it, that's an energy leak. That's a way, that's a way around it. And when you see something you so want to incorporate into your business, and you, you don't see the full spectrum of what you can actually do. Like just what you say about this AI, right? When I stop away from my business, my event planning business, I ask myself, which part of the event planning business I have it for 11 years, which part of it I really don't enjoy doing, but very good at it. I'm very good at it, but I don't really enjoy doing it. And, I, and, and I'm being defined by the general public about May is known for this. And stepping away from that image that May is known for that and to fully own that, yes, I'm known for it. I'm very good at it, but it's not really what brings me joy. I want yeah. to do something else that takes courage mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, for sure. For me, like the perfect uh, intersection is something that you enjoy doing that's also very easy for you. And like, that's where an area I think a lot more people need to focus on their business because- for like a lot of ways, like I'm really good at a lot. Yeah. Like you said, a lot of other things, but I don't enjoy doing them, but yeah, they suck up your energy and they make it. So then that way you can't maximize on the things that also you're really good at and might not take a lot of energy that you enjoy doing. And reality is like, you're probably maybe getting, maybe you're getting a hundred percent results from the, that thing that you don't enjoy doing, but you're doing it because you're good at it. But in reality, the things that like are easy that you do enjoy doing that you just like are crushing it at, but it's because it's so easy and so second nature for you. Like, oh my gosh, you're getting like 300, 400% from those returns. Um, and I think that's where we have to look at it in a lot of ways. And I think one of the things that you mentioned too is like, and again, like kind of a lot of it starts to come back to the trust of the team in a lot of ways is that like everyone just gets so caught up in this idea that like, can this person do what I do better than me? Or can they do it to this degree? I think at some point within the company, if you really truly want to build a company, it's never going to be as good as you. But like you have to give up that fallacy. You're you'll be it'll be amazing if you can find someone who's better at it than you. It's going to be amazing if you find someone who is as good as you, but you just have to accept the idea that not everyone can work to your same potential, especially like chances are if it's centered around you a lot, you're a rock star. And the challenge is like I've always thought to myself like, oh, I'm going to find people who can think as fast as Will and talk as fast as Will and, you know, provide that, that vibe like Will that makes clients want to sign up. And I found that I was like, I think that's really almost impossible to find. And you have to let go of that and recognize that like, hey, that's not what this is about, though. The, the, that You can put that energy and all that stuff that you're going to put in, put it into your next venture or put it into your passions in your life and things like that. And I think if you don't start moving towards this idea of trying that out, you're always going to be stuck in this vicious cycle. And I think that's the thing that um, is probably one of the biggest takeaways that people can take from this whole experience is that you have to – this doesn't happen overnight – and it takes a long time to do this. You got to start somewhere and you got to start with small experiments. You got to start by delegating initially and then, you know, delegating something maybe that you really love to do, but, you know, and, and giving that away and seeing what that's like and things like that. Um, I think as you start to do that, you start to realize like what the full potential of this really looks like. That is a perfect segue to the next question I have for you, right? We, we oh. talk about, we talk about retirement, right? We all now know that retirement doesn't mean that you don't have to do anything. Yeah. It's the fact that you have a choice. 
you have yeah. a choice that like today I was feeling a little tired. My yeah. choice is to take a nap, which I actually did for 90 minutes before I got on here with you. <laughs> I love it. I'm jealous. I'm going to take a nap after this. <laughs> you know, so I had a choice. I had a choice to take a nap. Yeah. I had a choice to only have two calls this morning and then take a nap and then go goof around after we finish this episode. That's my choice. For me, Easy. that's entrepreneurship. That's mm -hmm. my form of retirement. But yes. when I go balls to the walls, I go balls to the walls. Yeah, I, totally. I, I ask myself, how do I feel today? What does May want to do today? And mm -hmm. I have the mental capacity to just decide that, oh, today I want to work on my passion project. Today I want to do something that not very exciting, but still to do. It's okay. Yeah. So there is a good balance. For me, that's retirement. And I, I think you and I are on the same page. Same Definitely. page. Definitely. About that. So, okay. So when you... When, you know, do you actually have a game plan when you finally decide to retire? Okay. Like, can you elaborate a little bit more about what were the things that you, you had to put in place to make that retirement, the early retirement a reality? Yeah. Yeah. I, and I think like a lot of these tactics that I'm going to share are things also that just make running your business a lot more smooth. Um, so no matter whether you are ready to do this or whatever it may be, you probably have already heard this advice. And if you haven't heard this advice, please just start implementing this stuff right away. But a lot of it has to do with like building, yeah, to this point where you are not involved and doesn't require you. Um, and this is a little bit different. Like obviously there's tons and tons of content on how to sell your company and get completely out. And, you know, but I'm looking at the people who a more realistic option, especially for event companies uh, and event people is that more likely will happen instead is that the company will exist and then pay you whether you're working on site events or not, right? We need to get you outside of events or maybe even outside of the business process. You might've gotten out of events, you're not on site anymore, but now you got to get out of the business. So here's a couple of things that I think that really help make this, that when you start to build up this like, yeah, game plan. And I naturally was doing this because I'm a business nerd. I want to make the best business possible. And you know, a lot of these things I've learned over the years from other people are common practices that uh, make better run businesses. So the first thing is like, you got to be like a master of delegation. Like, you have to be totally good with giving and communicating tasks and letting other people do them. And this is really where you start to get out of the, I don't have to do this part of the business. Um, and at some point, like you're going to get to this point where like you might be trapped still within one role. It might be like you're the lead salesperson. You might be, you know, um, still like heading over maybe event strategy. But if you're still on site at events and you have to be on site of events, do everything you can to get outside the office, the on site, because that's the thing that's honestly one of the most uh, not drain, drain sucking because I love being on site events, but it's one of the areas that requires you to be at a specific place at a specific time. And you have to drop everything. You have to no, do more snow sales calls. You don't have to do any like passion projects and things like that. Um, and again, at, at, as May said, you have the choice if you want to go back to on site. You have that choice, but it doesn't require you. You don't have to say, oh, I'm missing my daughter's sixth birthday because I have to be on at this event. So I think delegating is where you get to that point. Start giving everything away. <laughs> like I, this is like a thing that's not like, oh, hey, like you do this in the span of one month, one day, or a year. This might take you years to just get rid of each individual process that you do it. But you got to know, be totally have like no sacred cows and be totally willing to give away every aspect of your job. Um, I, I famously and within my team used to get a lot of shit sometimes because people would say, Will, you can't just delegate every decision to someone else. Cause I would like notoriously sit in meetings, hear feedback and be like, what do you guys want to do? Because I was like, so about letting other people make the decisions and I wanted the company to work without me. Um, but at some point you might get to a point where your company gets stuck and like they require you to make decisions. Hopefully those decisions aren't things like what color the drapes are or what employee should we put on the show for this event or um, what should we put on this proposal? It should be more about like, where do you want to go? Do you want to be primarily a subcontracted company? Do you want to move things in house? You know, do we want to try to grow this year? Do we not want to try to grow like bigger conversations? Once you kind of get to that point where you're working on the bigger picture stuff, you can, you're really going to start to feel the ability to eventually 
retire early and get out of the business, which will be like, I think a third and final step. The next thing I think I recommend for everybody when it comes to this is you got to be like a master of, of documentation. So this is like, <laughs> especially important for like all, all business people, because like we, we think to ourselves that no one can ever do what I do, but in reality, if you wrote down everything and captured it, you can distill everything you've done into a very simple and easy process. Um, and the best way to do this is to create a company wiki. Start with things like your core values, your handbooks, stuff all those docs into it. But you got to make this like searchable database where people can write instructions on how to do things. Like an and SOP. What I did, like, yeah, your like SOPs like basically, SOP. yeah. yeah. And the way I always looked at it is that I always had kind of, I realized that there was always a kind of a particular way to do things that led to the best results. Mm. You know, when we create our case study videos, I found this perfect process and flow that led to an amazing case study that people really liked. So I wrote down exactly how to do it and what were all the steps necessary to do this. At some point, your business might get to the point where like, You've documented everything you can, but there is some creativity and wiggle room in there. But that's when you start to hire really, really great people. So my next step is that once you've doc you document everything, which by the way, most people don't document everything. Most people aren't, you know, the tools I recommend is like Notion, use Slab. Um, you can build like basically any sort of documentation. I recommend don't do this in Google Docs because it just gets lost with all your meeting notes and things like that. You need like a separate system that you can create links and link back to other documents and you know, oh, uh, if you need to know how to submit submit something for accounts payable, click this link, boom, it takes you over here, right? Um, so the next thing it kind of moves you to as you start to document these things that takes years, by the way, I started my documentation like maybe eight years ago and it's just one document at a time. And before you know it, you're at like 3,000, 4,000 documents all right now. But the next step after that point, sorry, I keep going back to documentation is hiring good people. This is the area that I think like a lot of people think is the first step as part of this. The problem is that if you are always looking for the best people you're going to get at this point where it might be too expensive for you to delegate something that you need to do. But in reality is if you, if you practice delegation really well, you know how to communicate your, what your desires are and you figured out how to document it. You can sometimes start to not need as, you know, the best event manager in the entire world because you can get somebody who's pretty good and then follows your documentation and follows your processes for your company. And I think that's really where, as you start to find it, you're really looking for people that match the culture, who love the documentation, all these things like that, and help build what you're kind of doing. The last little bit um, for, I think, the step that you need to move into this like ultimate retirement mode is they got to find the person who's going to like replace you. Who's this person going to be? And the thing about this is that, again, you always say like hire good people. No one really talks about documentation. Some people talk about good delegation skills. But if you documented really well and you've delegated really well, a person will start to emerge sometimes within your organization who can follow your vision and take it moving forward because you've communicated it so well to the point where they're communicating it just as well as you would have communicated it. I will admit there's sometimes you don't need to be looking internally. You might need to look externally, but you just have to keep in mind that costs a little bit of money. There's a ton of podcasts on like hiring your, you know, your, your, uh, and that I do traction is like our, our model for kind of running our company, um, which is like the EOS system. And they call it an integrator, the person who like takes the visionaries ideas and actually 100%. implements them. Um, so the, there's a ton of podcasts, Google, like how to hire your integrator and things like that. And there's a bunch of good stuff on there. Um, but Really what happens is if you built out really good delegation skills and you've documented it really well, and then you start to hire really good people, this stuff just starts to kind of fall into place. And I think ultimately for me, it became this point where I was very, in, it, it, I knew it was time was when I, we had a very busy event season coming up and we had like three events going on simultaneously and they were huge, just gi absolutely gigantic, gigantic events. And the team was talking about, oh, we need to hire this person and hire this person. And I was like, well, I can fill that hole. I can be on site and just do that one role, whatever you guys need to do. And granted, that's a really bad thing to do as an entrepreneur, <laughs> but like I wanted to help support. But the best part was I got the feedback of, we don't need you. Aww. And that's when I started feeling like, okay, like this is when I don't need to be on site to make sure everything runs really, really well. Um, and so I think if you build out this template of you know these things, I think that that's where you can start to get to that point where you can easily find someone and step out of the day to day and be only taking like a, a once a month meeting, checking in on the numbers and everything like that as well.
Um, and I, I know that was a lot, so I want to I want to shut up in a second. But the thing that I think that most people really screw up and don't do at all is the documentation. Um, so I want to give some tips around the documentation um, that I don't think we, we necessarily we're going to talk about. But the when it comes to documentation, build, get a system like Slab or Notion that lets you link to each other, that lets everybody edit it. You can set different people to not have edit to access. But the, the key things I think for do, for documentation is make sure your system has some sort of way to verify that it's up to date and sets a timer to remind the person who made the document to update it. Um, that's something I think that's really key in documentation. Notion just add that feature and Slab's had it for many years. But the idea like you write a piece of documentation, a lot of people complain about documentation when it's out of date. But if you put a verified stamp saying this is up to date, this is good to go, and then reminds the person that it's out of date to go update it and re-verify it, oh, that's killer. That's like... I wish I had that when I first started my documentation. Um, but the other thing when it comes to documentation is when you're first starting it, people get really trapped in this idea that having the employees participate in the documentation. It's easy for you. The tip I have is that whenever you do a task, just write out how you're doing yeah. it as you do it. It 100%. takes twice as long, but yeah. you knock it out the documentation, then you never have to do it again. Um, but the thing that I think where a lot of people get stuck is my employees don't want to document. And so my tip for you and for all those employees that don't want to document is that the beginning part is going to be hard. It's going to be, you have to be strict. You're going to need to make, you know, create contests around it. You're going to, it's going to like seem like an uphill battle, but once you start to get them involved in the documentation, you know, you're going to hear things like, why should I document for the person I, that's going to come after me? If they're literally replacing me, like, this is my job. I, what I know I do is my value. And, you know, like, I hate that argument completely because I most likely taught that person how to do what they do. So like, it's not really theirs. It's the company's anyways, but we'll keep going down that line. But the idea is like, once you start to push everyone to make documentation, what's going to happen is you're going to make your first hire that learned everything from the documentation. In my case, it was a salesperson and I hired that person and I built out all the documentation. I think I had a couple other people kind of contribute, but I mainly built all out documentation. They came in. And they loved the documentation so much. They knew how to do their job. They knew the specific things to go, the, all the answers that then when you asked them to update it, they knew why it was important because they benefited from it in the beginning. So they knew they didn't want to necessarily uh, screw over the person the first uh, for the next uh, event or the next hire. But also, too, they knew that it was like an important part of the business process. And what happens is you build this culture of documentation where, you know, you make jokes like, like I used to answer questions when people ask questions and it was in our documentation. I would just answer with a link to the documentation and say, here's the answer. Like, here you go. And people at first got annoyed and I sometimes would get made fun of. But when it gets to that point where people were like, oh, I have a question. Let me look at the documentation first. Boom. You're going to just like, that's when literally you start to become more than just a like a everything relies on the people. It starts to rely on the processes that you built. Oh, my God. <laughs> you are you're speaking to my heart so I think I myself can do better when it comes to documentation because we as event planners right we are constantly juggling with so many different data and yeah. and we're putting up fire we're making decisions on the fly so we just want to get it done and then we don't really have time to to do a debrief or actually create a, create a documentation for each process. And then we are on yeah. to the next project. So, so I think, you know, to quickly summarize, first is to delegate, second is to document, third is to, is to hire, hire people who can familiarize themselves with the documentation. And a lot of times, the last one is to hire somebody who can take over what you do, what you spend the most time with. Right, so it's either internally or outside. Now, before we even go into this whole process, personally, and you let me know whether you agree with me, is I think the biggest challenge is when, when someone who has not done any business before, they come up from corporate America, or they have a passion, they want to start a business, and they have zero experience in business, when they decide to start a business, I don't think that they think so far out what to do with the business. Mm, yeah. So they they are just going with the flow. And I myself for one, okay? Yeah. Yeah. When I started M2 Hospitality, 
even though it's 11 years in the business, I, I had never thought what I wanted to do with M2. I, I just know that, okay, I like planning events. I like um, sourcing for venues. I love the negotiating part. I love the event strategy part. I love picking up menus. I love beautiful venues. And I just love what I do. So I just you just continue to do love, to love what you do and then you get referrals and then you're just going the motion. The money is good. The money is coming in. You get to do what you want. And you don't think so much about what am I doing with this business? Yeah. For you, yeah. you're just, this is doing something for the business. You, you don't really think much about it. Yeah. And then when I started events for anyone um, in 2020, I think... One and a half years into it, I was like, you know what? I need to, I really need to not, not do what I didn't do <laughs> for M2. I need to think a bigger picture. What, what, how far, just like a business plan, right? What is the vision for the company? Yeah. And, and I think people get stuck at the very beginning when they're rough, drafting their business plan. They, they don't really have a defined vision or a mission. Yeah. They know what's their passion. And they, and they just do it, which is not a bad thing. So don't feel that if you don't have your vision and your mission, you are stuck, okay? Don't, do, don't, don't feel that way. Because once you start doing it, the vision and the mission naturally comes. Yeah, for sure. You know, naturally sure. comes. So for me, immediately, one and a half years into it, I started thinking, what are the things that I don't need to be involved day to day? And I started training. I started training salespeople, okay? I started training community leaders inside my Facebook group, support leaders. So, so I don't have to do this and I have more free space up here to do my documentation. Yes. <laughs> to definitely. do my documentation. So, so when I'm training, when I'm training my support, just don't think that it's so boring when it comes to documentation that you have to write out everything. Every time you do a task, like what Will says, every time you do a task, you record yourself or when you yep. do a training, you record that training and then yep. get, you know, get auto AI or, you know, just do a transcribe service and yep. they just transcribe everything into a documentation. Yep. So yes. that's your documentation. That's, this is the very low tech way. Okay. That's a very low tech way. Don't feel that you need to have all this tech software to be in place in order to start that process. And I think, do you agree with me? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, I think for a lot of people, they get trapped in like a little bit of that, yeah, that day to day. But like, once you start to get that initial, like, I get someone else to help me, like, use that freed up time to to continue to expand on high value activities like documentation, like you said. Um, yeah, because like most people don't think about it too. I mean, like, I talk about writing things down, but yeah, a we have. Uh, AI tools that you can probably take a summary of a, of a recording and then write it out, have it explain it even more eloquently than I could ever do. which, uh, you know, I missed that boat in a lot of ways. Cause that was <laughs> what, uh, that, that happened. Obviously I dealt with documentation before that existed, but, um, your point is that like a video, like a lot of people don't think about recording and screen recording that like walk through the task. So a tool that I recommend for this is called Loom, which a lot of people I think have heard of now at this point, and it records video on your screen really fast. And literally a lot of these tools, you just copy and paste the link in and boom, it's done. Um, so it's, it's very, very easy, but yeah, your point about like the vision too is important. Like, I think a lot of times, like your mission and vision, don't let other people tell you what your mission and vision is. Cause that's also one great way to enter burnout street faster than ever before. So don't do, don't just tell us to have someone else tell you what your vision is. You got to figure out what that looks like. But one thing I highly recommend is set forth like an end date for these things too. Like for me, I was in my 20s when I like really grew the company and then now I'm like in entering my 30s and I thought to myself, yeah, like I'll just keep going and keep going. But what I realized like over the course of my 30s is that you hit that like point where you're like, holy crap, I'm getting old. My body doesn't work the same way. My mind doesn't you're, work the same way it does. You're 33, Will. I, yeah, I know. I know. I just, I know, I just I know, turned 47 two days ago. Well, it's, it's it's important though, because for a lot of times, like we, we all know this, that like sometimes we get trapped that like before we know it, 10 years have passed so yes. quick yes. and we think to ourselves, I'm going to have the same desires. I'm going to have the same wants. I'm going to have the same energy levels. All Everything's going to be the same in 10 years from now, but that's not true. So we have to think about ourselves like in creating this kind of like goal end game. And it would be great if you set a goal and a vision for where you want to be in 10 years. 
And then you hit that goal and you sit there and say, yeah, I want to keep going. But that's an active decision that you make versus just, I think sometimes what ends up happening is we fall into the the blur of day to day. And before we know it, because we love what we're doing, 10 years has passed so quickly. But in reality, it's like, if you think about constantly improving and you think about setting that deadline, it lets you recognize like, where, where do I actually need to go now in the next three months? Now, how do I, how does that then extrapolate into the year? How does the one year extrapolate into the next three years? And then the next three years extrapolate into the next 10 years um, on there too. And, you know, that's a very classic kind of like traction activity that you can end up doing too. Um, but like, yeah, just don't just be always ready that time's going to fly so fast. So it's best to start making little bite-sized chunks towards this stuff. Otherwise <laughs> it's going to be like me where seven, 16, 17 years go by and I'm like, oh yeah, I think I'm ready for something new now. <laughs> It's great that you 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 pointed this out because I wanted to ask you how long did it take for, for you to got everything set up. But before we even go to that process, you know, I talk about getting stuck in your business plan. What's your vision? What's your what's your vision statement? What's your mission statement? Right. And I, I think we also have to get into the mindset and which you talk about a lot, which is really trust to delegate and really understand that it's a it's um fairy tale that you'll find your mini you okay mm -hmm. understand that that your goal is not to find your mini you okay the goal is to find someone who understands your vision your direction your goal support you and let that person shine and your documentation is going to indoctrinate them into your values yeah. so so do not try to find someone to replace you, okay? When I say replace you, what I'm, what I'm talking about is to one for one. No, find somebody who can replace you with their own strength and your training. That part is what people who don't think big or don't know how to think big because they don't have the direction, not because they don't want to, that they feel that it's a lot of time. It takes a lot of time to do that. It takes a lot of energy. It costs a lot of money. And ultimately, they can't trust. So these four, these four things are what cause them to not do anything to build towards their retirement. Do you agree? I couldn't agree anymore. Yeah, that's, I think, a really, really good point. I love your point about, like, the not looking for the mini you. Like, I think we always are trying to find, oh, yeah, I got to replace myself. Well, it's not always replacing someone with it exactly like you. Like, in the case of the person who replaced me, like, they're more pragmatic than I ever was. So, like, I think one of the things that's great is that, you know, I'm very – very much like sometimes get a little bit lost in the like ex the exciting visionary stuff and what ends up happening is my team kind of gets sometimes a little lost with it it's exciting at first but then it feels like a little hard to keep up all, all the time and one thing i like about the person who replaced me is that they're just so focused on like here's what our focus is and this is what we're going to do for the next like not only the next three months but maybe even the next year and we're just going to do the same thing and concentrate on that for so long when you, when you first started building the team, okay, when you first started building the team, did you use contractors? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I think like everybody, like you can't, have, you know, like at my first employee employee was an actual employee. And then like, as I started needing more and more work, yeah, I, I very much lent on contractors, but then like created a lot of processes that like made it so it's under my brand and it protect, like they were like following what my vision was. Um, but then, you know, as we started making the transition from being, you know, the, a production company to being an event management company, we realized that we needed more people who just generally got our vision of what we're trying to do. And that the li those little things that we documented saying like things like, hey, dress in this certain way. Hey, talk in this certain way. Uh, email in this certain way. Use these kind of tools. That was when it started pushing us away from contractors realizing that like, it was harder for us to like, hey, let's just hire a bunch of contractors because for them, it was like, okay, this is just another job. But like for us, we wanted to change it where it was like, these weren't just another jobs to a, to the people working the events. It was like everything to them. Our clients were our lifeblood. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it's totally cool to use contractors in the beginning, but then like at some point, I think depending on what your vision of your company is going to be, like for us, it was about this like quality level that we wanted to guarantee. Um, we start moving towards the the actual employees. Okay. So for people who want to stay boutique style, 
that means <clears throat> they want to stay one man show. Okay. What do you think they need to be doing now? Because they 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 still can't see them having a big team. I don't want to deal with employees, right? In corporate, I have a lot of people reporting to me. I don't want to deal with people anymore. So I just want to be boutique style, have a few anchor clients, but I want to be able to stay away from the day-to-day -day as much as possible. How would you suggest that they go about building their business so that they can get to retirement? Yeah, first tip I'd have for like almost every entrepreneur is like hire a personal assistant. Uh, you know, start with a virtual assistant and you can do it in person if it, if that's what's necessary. But I think 99% of what you need is honestly can be done virtually and, you know, like dropping off the dry cleaners, let's be honest, like that's probably an enjoyable break that you would enjoy anyways. But um, I always say like hire an assistant because A, an assistant's good because it lets you practice that delegation and everything like that. But for me, it's a personal assistant. And the reason why is that for a lot of ways, like we get kind of stuck in like doing small, dumb things. Let's be honest, like uh, scheduling our doctor's appointment, um, checking through our email just to make sure there's nothing urgent that I really need to need check back to. Like these sort of things that like don't seem like a big amount of energy suck, but you do them enough. They like just, it drags on you and doesn't let you focus on sometimes bigger, better things. So I recommend for everybody is like hire a personal assistant and like, you know, I understand everybody's a little afraid in the beginning to give people access to your emails, give access to like a password manager so they can log in accounts. But as you start to build that trust, have them do a couple things like book trips for you, you know, have them do the doctor's appointment and then start to give them more and more and then just start letting it really flow where they can really see everything that's going on in your life and help you as much as possible. Like, I think that's absolutely a game changing thing that anyone could start doing like today. Um, you know, like my, my friend too, I was telling him about this. He was just like, I never thought about having the assistant do personal things too. And the thing is like, if it can free up time from you personally in, and let's say, for example, you really enjoy working and not scheduling doctor's appointments, it's going to allow you to maximize what you're doing, make more money, all those fun things. The next thing I think I, I recommend for anybody who wants to like stay small, but get out of the day to day is you got to build a wall between you and your clients. This is in the form of like a customer success person, a project manager, like dear God, make it where you're like, you're not answering the client's questions directly. Maybe you're hopping on calls. Maybe you're getting the questions from that project manager that then you give them the answer. But so much of us get trapped into talking directly with clients. And especially in a case like events where it's high stress, right. sometimes that drains us from being able to do other things because we're playing more time managing client expectations and stress and things like that. Then we do really like designing our events and thinking about events and all that fun stuff. Um, my next step I'd recommend for most people is like, and, and that might be in the form of like, you just have a contractor who represents you really well and just like absolutely slays and just takes care of everything. But chances are they're going to have to have your company email. They're going to be needing company shirts, all those things like that. And chances are, if you, I mean, the, this is my one IRS tip is that like, you're starting to look like an employee at that point. Exactly. So highly yeah. recommend you understand the difference between an employee and contractor. Cause that's a great way for the government to come after you. Um, but the next step I have for people is also getting is to try to focus on making it where it's not required for you to get your next client. Um, this is a, a very fucking hard area. Sorry if, uh, for cussing. Um, but this is so hard is like getting the customers because a lot of people are sold easier by you because they 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 see your passion. They say they want the owner. The most common thing that happens is, a, oh, are you going to be at our event? You know, I hated that question. I always, I never wanted people to think I was going to be at their event or I was going to help sell them because I was so active in the sales process. Um, but also too, like, how do you market? So if you can figure out how to get clients and then you can figure out how to make sure that those clients get actually happen, their events actually happen, you can almost accomplish that with two people alone, depending on what your scale is and all those things like that. And then you can have the one person, client success person, manage all the contractors and things like that. But what I found is that like, managing contractors and internal people is like 1000% easier than managing clients and external expectations because like when you're when you're doing sales and you're doing client management like you, you just have to be on it 
all the time, like professional, looking great, always wearing an endless shirt, you know, like all those things like that. But in reality is like you want the ability to make it where you don't have to worry about that so that you can have an off day and that your team will internally, if they know you and trust you, they'll, they'll, they'll support you throughout having that off day. But a lot of people end up getting caught having that initial com uh, communication. Also, I think most of us really suck at setting the right boundaries for great client expectations. So like we get stuck in things like answering emails on, on at night, answering emails on the weekend, um, you know, client asks for this one thing last minute, you end up deciding to edit that video yourself because you want to make the client happy. But the more that you can remove yourself, I think from that, the more that it gives you headspace to, to, to grow and work on other things like work on, figuring out the accounting process, figuring out maybe a marketing campaign that gets you more clients, um, that sort of stuff. But I think almost like get out of, I think you need to get out of the client management thing first um, and then focus, I think, on the client sales. And then once you're there, you get to play in this space where your team might come to you for, hey, I need an idea for this design. Okay, cool. When do you need it by? Oh, next week. Okay, cool. Well, I'm going to take the next two days off. I'll do it on the third day. Or I can work on it at my own pace but not at the pace of the clients and not at the pace of the information. And it allows you to act that, have that buffer inside there. When you started the show, you said that the first step of retirement is to remove yourself from any activities that you have to be there, right? Yeah. Like if you have to be on site, no, sorry, buddy, not, not happening. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. So, yeah. so you are so right that you there needs to be a boundary between you and client fulfillment and client yep. fulfillment. If you train, if you train your clients well enough, you don't have to be there. I will tell you 75% of the clients I work with, I don't even have to be at their event because mm -hmm. I have trained the clients so well to trust my vendors. And I have trained the vendors so well to understand what needs to be done. Or I have a contractor on site that I don't have to be there. You know, that I can choose whether I want to be there or not. So that, and then the second most important thing that you need to focus on is you cannot be the only person doing sales. You yes. absolutely cannot be. Because totally. if you are in the hospital or something happens, you go on vacation, the company still need to eat, right? Yep. Yep. So yep. what do we need to do to sell? And I think there's always a fear, but if you have a salesperson to do the sales for you, what if they take the sales away from you? I didn't say you you just go MIA. What yeah. I'm saying, you know, you, you, you are not going MIA. You're trusting your salesperson, but at the end of the day, you are the account holder, right? Yep. You are budding with your salesperson. Listen, if the client wants to go, they will go regardless of what. Yeah. Yeah. Am I yeah, right totally. to say that? Yeah, 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 for sure. Like I I find like a, a good strategy with this is have someone lead, be the lead, like salesperson, lead all the small questions. They initiate all the emails. They're the ones who follow up meetings with notes, but then you're the one who maybe hops on that call to like hear what they have to say and then share your ideas and things like that. I think like that's a great place for people to be at, but like you shouldn't have to be like concentrating about every single detail. Like that was the thing I really didn't like when I first started delegating. I was like, I didn't want to be in charge of all the details of the event. Cause I realized that like, I wanted to play in the space of like ideating and thinking. And, you know, I wanted to be able to use my sales skills to help close the deal and that sort of stuff. And I think that really when you start to um, kind of create that tag team system, that's a great way to like start to delegate that, that to get you out of that sales process. Right. I, I think we, as an event planner, designer, we spend a lot of time crafting the proposal. So what yeah. I what I used to do, uh, what I still do is I have a, an assistant get on a call with me and then I go through the whole process with the potential client, qualification, the whole nine yards, and then we start talking about the vision for the event. And then I start thinking, I start to create on the spot and the client wants it. We talk about the, we talk about money. Everybody agrees on that. And all these are recorded. And then I have the I have the assistant write out everything. Write out the nice. proposal, get the image in, and then send the proposal, copy me, so the client can see, can see that okay, the like okay. I'm still letting the client know. I introduce my assistant to the client and say yeah. that, hey, listen, ABC XYZ is working with me on this particular project. So you will have a lot of communication with her. But today's call is for me to create this vision for you. And she will do all the other admins and email correspondence, but I will be copying on it, you know, if that, that needs to be. 
but you you still get involved, but yep. you are involved from afar. Now you're also building your team's confidence that they have a part in closing the deal with you, and you're yep. not deal you're not dealing with the daily minutia of having to format the proposal, having to you know follow up with the proposal. No, for sure. So I I think this is probably the baby steps that that people can can take but they don't see how to go about doing that without feeling a little bit overwhelmed. So I just broke it down for them. So Amazing. thank you. Thank you so much for, <laughs> for giving us the big picture, you know? For sure. So, okay. All right. So now that we are 16, 17 years in, right? Did you ever think that it would take you this long? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I I didn't really want it. So like, I didn't really think it like this didn't seem like a long time, but I, I honestly wish that I had not been st yeah, stuck. I think in a lot of ways with my, um, you know, uh, desire to like my, my ego, I think in a lot of ways, like in those times when my employees were saying, Hey, maybe you want to consider not being the CEO, try this different role. I wish I'd let my ego go and been like, yeah, like let's explore what that looks like. Um, but I, I, I think that that would have sped up the process, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, I think in a lot of ways, too, that I wish that um, I had done this kind of process. Like, I wish I had taken this leap in a time of growth. So, like, during pan the pandemic, we had a lot of this stuff in place that we are in now, but we were growing so fast. And I kind of wanted to ride that growth mm -hmm. because I got excited about the idea of expanding the company and doing this and blah, blah, blah. But in reality, like I almost wish that when the company was just at its peak doing this, that I had kind of given it to someone else too. Because uh, one thing I think I've recognized now is that like me as a company, as a like a, as an entrepreneur, is that I think I enjoy the like zero to four, you know, four million dollars in revenue, where like the point where you've built out this documentation, you built some processes, you figured out how to everything, the system runs and everything like that. You know, the thing I don't like is once you start to get to the 40, 50, 60, 100 employees. And that's honestly, I think when that's where we kind of got to that level during the pandemic. And I think I like because it was new and exciting to me as a as a like a first time reaching that number of employees and that size of that company. I was like, I want to be a part of this. But in reality, like I wish I had a time machine to go back and be like, Will, you're not going to enjoy that as much as you think you're going to enjoy it. Like know the things that you do enjoy, which is like you're where you're at in this current period before this all happened. So I think identifying, being really honest with yourself that you don't have to be an entrepreneur that grows the next Facebook, that grows the next, you know, um, George P. Johnson, you know, like it doesn't have to be the next big company. It doesn't even have to be a medium sized company. But if you like, like that small area, I wish that I had made that decision to delegate because I probably financially would have made more sense, made a lot more money that way too, um, than trying to like ride this massive storm um, as the company grew completely. Um, and I think that's something that we don't want to necessarily think about because you think that, oh, hey, my company's getting bigger. I'm going to make more money. But I'll give shout outs to an uh, actual industry person. I won't name them um, on here. But they said I had, I had breakfast with them one time. And I was like, when I was first starting my company and uh, we had become a production company, and we we're just starting to make a name for ourselves. And I was having breakfast with this person who ran a very, very successful event production company. And he said, well, where are you at in revenue? And I told him and he was like, oh, I remember those days. I made so much more money back then. And I like was like, oh, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing pretty good right now. I'm pretty happy. But then I didn't like realize like there is a certain point that if you decide to scale your company up, that it it becomes harder to make money. And ah. I think that and I think that's like no, no one really <laughs> talks about that. And it's it's really, really hard, I think. So like I think people have to be really honest with the idea that like, what do you really want out of this? Are you prepared and have the experience to get to that level or can you be okay with getting this company to $4 million in revenue and then delegating it to someone else? And then now you really get to restart that, that process all over again. Oh my God. I, I, I bet you, you know, I, I, I couldn't believe you actually saying this. Is this actually the next question that's going to come out from my mouth before we talk about your community? <laughs> I wanted to, you know, because everybody's talking about scaling. Should I scale? Should I not scale? How should I scale? The fear of scaling, you know, yeah. there's this point. There's this point that 
when you're at a certain revenue and where you are stretched out to the max that you realize that there's no more of me that I can stretch and I need to find somebody to do this for me and with me. But because you're so used to keeping all this money to yourself because you mm -hmm. don't have to pay anybody else, that first fear, the fear, the initial fear of having to pay someone a salary, being responsible for someone's livelihood, and then you see your profit margin diminish because all you see is money going out and yeah. not money coming in fast enough because, well, you're still just the employee number one and only employee. All the money goes into your bank. But now the money is not going to your bank and you're not seeing the money coming in, replacing the money coming out at the pace yeah. that you want. How do you handle that fear? Yeah, like, um, you know, I think there's part of it that like that advice that I got was was true, that there is a certain scale where you like you have to find this like right balance, but it's not the same for everybody. It's not like, oh, once I hit a million dollars in revenue, I'm like going to start making lots of money. Like it really depends. There's people who make like, do $500,000 a year in revenue and take home a quarter million dollars in revenue. Then there's also million dollar businesses that bring them home a quarter million. I've also heard and seen uh, businesses that have a million dollars in revenue and barely, like they can barely afford to pay their founder their salary. Yep. Right. So like, it's to totally possible on the, on those, all those scales, but for, for, the the fear, which I think is like where most people are going to end up getting at, is that they're going to start to see that they're investing their money. The whole goal is that you should hopefully have a system that when you invest that money, it makes more money oh, in right. that way. And maybe it's not necessarily – sometimes I think especially for events because we're so calendar-centric, it's not necessarily that you'll make – more money, but you'll have more consistent money, or maybe that money will come in more rapidly. Um, because we all have been there before where we're, we, you know, we're an event contractor and we do a big show and we're like, Oh my gosh, I just made so much money. But then you look at your calendar, you're like, I got the next three months off because like, I, and I got to look for my next gig or I'm prepping for the next show and I'm not bringing in that cash flow that I wanted then at that point. And for me, like, I think where you should be trying to design your business is design it where the point where it's consistent and you, and it's not seasonal um, on there too, because that's the kind of stuff that makes being in this industry really, really hard because we're so calendar centric um, and so large project centric. Um, so that's my tips for that. And then I think also too, like, you just also have to recognize too that if it's only you and it's like the so, you're the solopreneur and you're making a ton of money, but it all relies on you. You actually mentioned this uh, analogy, which is like the if you get hit by a bus tomorrow kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, we like to say if you won the lottery tomorrow, <laughs> that's a very common documentation uh, saying here at Endless is like if you won the lottery tomorrow, how do we know that like how to do your job? You know, like let's put a more positive spin on it. But if you win the lottery tomorrow. Um, it, for you, you'd obviously like quit and be done, but in a lot of ways, your company would probably cease to exist in that moment. And I, maybe the lottery example isn't necessarily the best, but let's say, for example, you were actually hit by a bus. Cause I think we do have to go a little bit more morbid on this one. What would happen if you have a family or you have kids or whatever it is? Like who's, how's that money going to keep making sure it goes to them? And, you know, sure, you could have a badass life insurance policy, but wouldn't it be better if that could just continue to run without you and pay your family? And the life insurance policy is maybe like a savings account for your kids to go to college since college costs a million dollars a year now, um, whatever it may be. But like, I think at some point you have to re recognize what you want from it. And that step, you have to let go of the idea of like, uh, oh my gosh, I'm making filthy money right now at a small, uh, small stage. Because if you're unhappy, you never get to take a vacation and everything relies on you right now. And the pressure is all on you. Like I would rather trade a cup, you know, a little bit of money every year for a little bit of sanity because that sanity stuff <laughs> is literally priceless. And as somebody who has gotten to that stage now where I've gotten a chance to like taste the afterlife of getting to like actually get out of the business, I would pay anything right now to keep where I am at right now. And if I can figure out a way to even like lower my potential, my, 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 my living costs, whatever it may be, I would totally do this because it literally when you get to the stage, I just think my potential has gotten 10 times higher. And that's something that no one really talks about. And you really can't, don't know until you experience it yourself. hundred percent, a thousand percent, you know, we we are so focused on what's going out and not what's coming in. Come, what's coming in is not just money, but your peace, your yeah. happiness, your the, the your choice. 
to yeah. to expand your creativity and do whatever you want with up here and physically and wherever you want to to be so yeah. so the analogy about you can make a million dollars in revenue or five million dollars in revenue but you oh you can't even pay yourself a salary or yeah. you can make a million dollars in revenue and you keep three seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars because you are mad you're able to keep your operation so lean that's yeah. how M2 hospitality is. Our cost of operation is no more than 15% of our, of our total revenue. So Amazing. I get to keep a lot because I'm also selective about who I want to work with and how many projects I want to do yes. a year, You're right? So, yeah. so it's, not, it's not that you make a lot. I don't care about revenue. I care yeah. about your bottom line. How much do you keep? The gen general uh, business advice I heard, uh, Revenue is vanity, profit is sanity, but cash is king. Exactly. Cash is king. Exactly. And not not all types of cash, because if you have account receivable, you know, floating out there, that ain't no cash. That, that, that ain't cash. <laughs> that ain't no cash. So, so this is what I, I teach inside our highest tier mentorship program, Empire, you know, um, Empire Builders, where we talk about where we talk about when you hire somebody, you got to have a KPI of understanding what is their return on investment. When I when I pay you $60,000, $100,000, how am I measuring your efforts, your progress? And you are going to give me back, you know, if I have pay you $100,000, I expect a 10X, you know, or yeah. a 5X. So you've got to know your numbers to know how to measure. And when you hire this person, you need to be able to communicate to this person your expectation that I pay you this much, you need to produce this much yep. and how to go about doing that. Go back to the documentation, right? Yep. How do we yep. go back? Yeah. How do we achieve that? Look at the numbers. This is the process, right? And then let them tweak their own process. It's not that is certain core ways to do certain things because that is your company processes, but I let you, let you educate me. Do you see a better way to do it? No, I like, I, I think always giving a KPI per employee is very, very smart to do. Like the ability to know, like, what am I looking to get out of this? Because so many times, especially if you're like a more humanistic person, people person, leader, you sometimes get stuck hiring and keeping people around because they do a good job. They make yeah. clients happy, blah, blah, blah. But you need to make things more measurable. Otherwise, like you get stuck in this like emotional side of the business. And to be honest... That emotional side of business is what keeps you wanting to hold on to your baby in a lot of ways. But in reality, like at some point, this baby that you're going to have is going to start sucking you dry. And you really need to like make sure that like if you think about things objectively and you look at the numbers, you can start to build a system process that makes it so it actually, hey, I hire this person. They make this much money for me as the entrepreneur, um, which is, I think, a really big step that a lot of people need to move towards. So, yeah, 100 percent. You're right. Yeah. Okay, so now let's talk about this other business that you're building. Oh, yeah, the new, the new business. Yeah, the new <laughs> business that you are building that is going to benefit a lot of us in the events field. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so out of like my journey uh, towards retirement, um, you know, I've I've always naturally been a community builder. Uh, I've been, like helped manage communities. I've helped associations grow. Obviously, like we do events for communities all the time. Um, but I kind of got to this point where I realized like, a lot of like the events industry community is stuck on social media in a lot of ways. And I don't know about everybody else out there, but um, I get distracted by social media. Like I have a little bit of an ADD personality. So I get excited when I see a cow picture or a cat video or whatever the heck it may be. But also too, like I hop on platforms like LinkedIn and I kind of get drained to be honest. Like everybody's talking about how successful they are and everything like that. And you know, the best way I saw a video describe this is that LinkedIn just feels like it's cringe in a lot of ways. But people generally crave the idea of being brought together in community. They need a space like the one that you guys have where people can ask questions, they can get help, they can connect with other people that are like them. Everybody craves that. And a big trend that I see in the events industry right now is that communities are the future of marketing and also the future of marketing for your events to keep that audience year round engaged. Well, I saw a lot of people talking about this, including myself, and I was like, well, I'm preaching, but 
there's no good example of this. So I decided to build it instead. So what I did is I built an online private community where basically anybody can join. Um, you obviously have, you have to apply and we have to obviously accept you, but you can at least apply. And the idea is that we wanted to create a safe private place that's off social media, off the distraction, but still had all the benefits, the notifications, the, the different spaces for different things like asking questions versus looking for vendors, basically create this like ultimate online community for event professionals. And I basically built it. So um, if you go to event profs community, um, that's what it's called. And it's basically my now that free space that we've been talking about all episode about where my brain was going to go is now getting dumped into this community about how can I now build this space that allows me to do the things that I've been doing for years, like my podcast and all these things I got into a central place where everyone can learn from it, where they can help each other. And uh, it's been absolutely amazing. So uh, we launched in uh, a, a June of last year and it grew extremely quick to the point where I had like 900 free members. And uh, we actually, <laughs> it got hard to manage it as a free community. Uh, it, this is kind of a sense I think where a lot of people get to in the business sense. They're like, oh, I just love doing this. I'm going to do it for free. And then you're like, I want to scale this up, but how do I do it? I need to get more revenue in. So we actually paid, became a paid community in February and now we're at a hundred paid members and we'll probably be at like 300 by the end of the year. And yeah, it's been like absolutely amazing. It's basically a place where you can go to ask questions. Like I'm in it. I check it every day. So I get literally, you're getting my like thought knowledge inside of it. And then I've surrounded it with all the smartest people in the events industry. So I basically handpicked, you know, a ton of people that I really, really respect and was like, I just, force them to come in and join this community. <laughs> so now like when people ask questions, you're getting like the top thought leaders in the events industry asking your question after everything. Like, do you have a, a, a template for your budget to, Hey, like I posted in here, what's the best shoes for events. And I'm going to see like what kind of shoes everyone's wearing that increases the comfort when they're on site. Right. Um, and it's all that fun stuff. So yeah, it's a, it's a lot of fun. So the event profs community is what's all about. So I can so probably talk about it forever. So if we look for it online, it's called Event Profs, P-R-O-F-S, community. Yes. Event with no S, Event yeah. Profs, community, correct? Yep, that is correct. That's okay. that's the that's the way. So who who are the people? So I'm, you know, we talk about this. I haven't action, I haven't action on it yet, but I will because I was very busy celebrating my birthdays and stuff like that. So <laughs> okay. It. So tell me who are the people inside the community? What feel in the events feel are they inside the community? Yeah, it's actually really great. It's actually like a, a little bit slight majority, like maybe like 55% planners um, and 45% suppliers. Um, and the reason why I wanted to do that is, A, I think planners can help from teaching each other things without necessarily a supplier always saying my solution is the best solution um, on here. But what's great about the mix of the people that are on there is that they're all experienced. So that like the application process was important for me because I wanted to make sure that I wasn't just filling it with everybody who's just getting started in the industry. Because if everyone's getting started in the industry, like how do you help each other? So I wanted to build the initial set of people to be extre extremely experienced. So the average level of experience that we have is 11 to 20 years of experience in the industry. With actually, I'd say the next highest category is 20 plus years of experience. Mm -hmm. um, so very, very experienced planners um, and then very, very experienced vendors too. So what's also great, and I think when we talk about vendor mix of things, it's important to note this is like, we like have very, very simple no spam policies. So like the idea is like, you're not coming on here and you're seeing a post from XYZ vendor every single day, just spamming what their services are. When you, someone asks for help in something, the vendors that actually can help are the ones responding then at that point, but you're not seeing like tons and tons of spam on here. And that was a big goal of mine because I'd honestly, as somebody who used to post a shit ton of content online, um, I didn't want to make it a place where it was just crowded with, blog post from uh, a, a certain blog or something like that too. Okay. Fantastic. I, you know, even in my free community, we had a very strict no spam policy. So, oh, so good. So like I, I have to approve every single post. So if I cool. see someone do a self promo, I decline, but with feedback. So That's I say, awesome. if, I say, if you are, if you are your intention to join my 8,000 over members group is to self promo, you're in the wrong group. Yeah, hundred so percent. I was I I was very direct. I said this yeah. is hundred percent educational purposes. So you're in the wrong it. group. So I love it. Okay. I love it. So I, I I love that. And um, I you know when we last spoke, I think do me a big favor. Just send you know 
offline, send me the link again because I actually will benefit myself as a season planner for over 20 years of experience and owning okay. my business for, for 11 years can see myself benefiting. Like I have a whole ton of events coming out all around the country. Totally. And I am first to proclaim that I don't know what I don't know. Okay. Sure. So sure. if I have vendors in a certain geographic area and I need a particular venue and I need a particular look, I can just go in there and ask and say, who, who here is from this area or have done events in this area and share with me who you use. Like how yep. do you go about executing that? So, exactly. And that's, and that's I, the best part is like, so the whole community is not just one gigantic feed too, where it's like, oh, oh, hey, like I have to log in every day to keep up. They're all broken in separate sections. So like, for example, we have an ask the community area where you can just ask general questions, but we knew that people asking for finding vendors was going to be important. So we created that looking for vendor section. And so like I posted on there, I'm about to plan an event in the Bahamas. And I was like, hey, I want to start building some connections for this event concept that I'm developing in the Bahamas. Can someone, you know, share some of their favorite connections that they have here. And people are like, they don't even necessarily the vendors are like, oh yeah, I know this person. You should meet Bob. And like, it, it's cool because then a lot of those people end up joining the community because of it. Cause they're like, oh, I can see people are talking about me here. We did the same thing for like contracted staff. Like there's a lot of freelancers in our group that are amazing producers, amazing event professionals. And you know, someone's like, Hey, I need someone to pick up. I have a show last minute, two weeks, someone got sick. Can you come and do this? People respond like, boom. Yeah. I'll jump right on in there too. So yeah, like it, it's cool because it's all sec. There's a dedicated space for every Everything, including an industry calendar. We have our own community calendar. Um, there's a lot of really great stuff inside. I I, I love that. I, I had to turn down like six events in June, in June, because I didn't want to work. Yeah. I don't want to work because Amazing. I am I am going to, I mean, I'm going to I go to Singapore every June and I every single June I went back, I sort of checked my email. But this time around, I actually told my clients, I said, listen, I um that's a very good agency. Yeah, exactly. That's a very good agency that we work with. So, Amazing. So we're with this agency and I want to be able to find people who's able to support me. This is the part about delegation, correct? Totally. Totally. 100%. 100%. Building a, building a network to support. Okay. So tell me how much does it cost? Yeah. So I want to make like pricing super duper straightforward. Um, so we do a yearly annual payment. So the annual membership is 250 bucks mm -hmm. to join. Um, what also we did is for some people, if you need to, we do quarterly. I think quarterly is like a hundred bucks a month. So it's a little bit more expensive if you take the whole year, but if you're like, Hey, I only have a hundred bucks to put into this right now, you can totally do it. Um, the best part about it is I have a 90 day money back guarantee. So you have like 90 days to come in here, test it, try different things, whatever you want to do within it. And if you're not happy, you literally just send a message to any one of our community managers and we'll literally refund you. No questions asked. Um, the idea was like, we know that there's a level of secrecy and privacy within it. Like we don't share a lot of screenshots of what's going on because we want to make it private, but we know that like sometimes once you get in and you get a chance to feel for it, this is what it's like. So, um, but I will tell you right now that uh, and all the members, we've never had anybody cancel and never had anybody ask for their money back. Like everyone's really, really happy. Um, so this year, I think we're going to end up growing one of the biggest online communities for event professionals. I think the fact that you by application only, and you know, I think that was one of the questions I asked, how many percent suppliers, how many percent? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And like okay. we, uh, yeah, like that's one of the great things too, is like, I wanted to make it so there's at least a simple barrier to entry and like anyone who's community managing, like having an application process allows people to want skin in the game. And that was also a reason why I went to a paid community too, is like, Sometimes like when you're in like a LinkedIn group, for example, it, like no one has skin in the game there. Like no one has the desire to really log back in unless they have a question. I wanted to make it where it's like, hey, I want to get the most amount of value from this. And so by giving people skin in the game and making them participate in the form of uh, sharing a piece of their wallet in this case uh, and or, you know, having to apply, it makes people way more engaged. And like our engagement from the, the previous free community was like something like I think like 5% of people were engaged. Now we're at like, like a 95% engagement wow. rate, which is just like unbelievably awesome. Perfect. So they have to just download, download an app 
to be able to to get first they the have best to apply. way yeah 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 the process is just go to eventpropscommunity.com you can do it on your phone or on your computer and there's the applications right there it's super easy to do um and then once you get accepted um or if you get accepted i should say um i certainly hope anybody who's like smart enough to be listening to your awesome podcast that we would totally accept them but once you get accepted we'll send you an invite you can use set up your profile on your computer or your phone but the best part is there's a dedicated mobile app and that was important for me because i wanted the ability where you didn't have to like know what was going on in the community and have to go into your email to do that to like oh email notifications were the only way i know if someone replied to a message so i want to make it where it's right on someone's lock screen so it feels just like a slack or a facebook or anything like that so it's a super fast experience and uh yeah dedicated app which i think is also something that makes it completely more unique than any community out there okay so to wrap up about this community if anyone were to join how should they use it so that they can make the most out of it. Yeah. I think the first thing I would recommend is like, start by introducing yourself. Like a lot of people like, uh, you know, I'll give a Nick Borelli shout out right here is Nick Borelli said, I, one thing I love about it is it's not all the same people going to the same conferences. It's a lot of unique people, but at a very amazingly high level of experience. So one thing I recommend is like, first, just start by introducing yourself because there's so many people in the industry we've never met, never heard of. And I find that this is bringing together a lot of circles and edges of the, the, the entire event profs community globally coming together. So introduce yourself is one of the first things next thing is just ask questions don't be afraid to like lay down on your sword and say hey i need help with this because there's so many smart people ready to answer questions um start by asking questions the other thing is too is like we have a share the win section like a lot of times as an entrepreneur we get stuck like really having no one to talk to about like what we did right Oh, I just executed this absolutely amazing event or I just like absolutely crushed it and we had our best year of revenue ever. Like I create a space in the community dedicated for you to gloat, to share your wins, to share your favorite things and like for the community to surround you and applaud you and, you know, go nuts with gifts in the comments. And I wanted the ability to create that space. So also do that too. And that's just like one of three things you can do within the community. We have events inside the community. We have, uh, I'm looking at right now, we have partners you can check out. We have like tons of documentation and information you can learn things from, you know, like there's just so much stuff. We have a chat room that you can join as well. There's just so much to do, but say hello, ask questions, get the help that you need and share your wins. And I think that like, you're going to have so much fun inside the community. Oh, I, I, I know that already. All right. So <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I will, um, there will be a, to make everybody's life easy, I will put a link in the, in the show notes as well so that they can go check it out. And I will, when I shrimp this, I will also put that in the show notes. So everybody, everybody knows about that. And, and hopefully they'll be accepted into the community. Maybe you should start thinking, maybe having a baby circle for people who are newbies and then maybe Ooh. have a few Jedi in there to guide these newbies. A hundred percent. We can totally do that. That's the best part about it. It's like infinitely expandable into subgroups. So as we get bigger, we can also create subgroups within there too. So yeah, everyone should definitely go check out that link. Like even apply, even if you're not sure you really want to be in, Um, you know, we send a bunch of like videos and behind the scenes stuff at once you've applied so you can like see the inside of it but even just apply and check it out and it's completely free to apply and then you can decide whether you want to pay the 250 or not um at that point but definitely apply check it out it's pretty awesome all right that brings us to an end you know normally my podcast is less than 30 minutes my very first guest i cannot just keep it within that 30 minutes. <laughs> there's so much to share thank you so much for for really sharing with us your whole journey of what retirement really is. And I'm so glad we're on the same page and, and you have validated for me that I'm on the right path to, to, um, to retirement, <laughs> to retirement <laughs> and to really break it down into very simple steps that it's possible for anyone who wants to do it. And, and, even for someone who started so young, takes this long and to learn from you what you would have changed and done differently, that probably just shorten our learning, our learning curve. And hopefully from, from listen, listening to me, how I myself have done it through the whole process has helped them shorten the learning curve. And, and thank you for, for being retired to be able to create this community 
for all events veteran and I'm super excited and I can I can see it in our near future that probably in in a year or even less that you will have a um, another inner circle for for our newbies because I think us veterans us veterans really benefit from one another to tell us not to get jaded yeah. about the industry there's still yeah. so many things that we can enjoy in what we really love and to reunite our passion in the events field but for us to give back to the community in the inner circle for people who are really invested in their passion to turn it into profit that's what I'm all about and to learn from people who are so so experienced and has a track record to show that they have success and for for this circle to guide them along, I think that community is going to explode. So. Thank you so much. Well, I appreciate that. I'm I'm excited for it. I'm 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 going to attach that to my vision board right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for your time, Will. I it has been a pleasure. I am so grateful that the universe brought us together. And Definitely. um, thank you for thank you for everything that you do for us. Everything that you do for the events community. So. My dear audience, my dear audience, thank you for giving me your time listening to this particular podcast or if you're watching it, um, I hope you will watch it a few times to really take down some notes and tell yourself that sometimes you may not have the answer, but when you start taking action and take baby steps, they all fall into place. All right, they all will fall into place as long as you, you know what makes you happy and honor your happiness and doing what you love, everything will always work out. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. I will talk to you again next week. Thank you, Will.